Today I'd like to share with you how I've been growing this beautiful little flower in my gardens for eight years. It's called a nasturtium and it's an edible flower. So I'll first go over why you may want to grow it and then I'll show you how I plant it every year and some of the water and feeding requirements along with some problems that you may experience and how to harvest it in ways that you can use this edible flower in your kitchen. So in researching some of the information about this flower, I ran across something very interesting. It was published in the Journal of Food Science that this wonderful little flower has very high concentrations of lutein. I recently visited my eye doctor and she recommended that I take an eye supplement and this eye supplement was mainly lutein and um, the petals of the nasturtium flowers are very high in lutein but the green leaves are as well. So if you're not familiar with lutein and how it can help your eyesight along with many other things in your body, I'll leave a link below the video so that you can also read about it if you like. So this video is actually on how to grow nasturtiums and not on lutein, but I do briefly want to touch on it. And when the flower petals are compared to many other vegetables that I grow in my garden, it comes in number one. So I was very surprised by this. And the reason being is because I ended up having a problem with my eyesight and it is actually something it looks like I'm inherited from my father who was legally blind in one eye and so he had a problem with his macula and that's what I have so um, I've had 20-20 vision my whole life I've never worn glasses and then all of a sudden I had a problem with my eyesight so I really researched a lot of ways that I could get lutein into my diet and there you go I had this beautiful flower I've been growing for years and all I have to do is start eating more of these petals along with maybe taking the supplement that my doctor recommended so I wanted to make sure to share this with you guys my father was a gardener and our macula is exposed to a, probably a lot more blue light than it has ever been in the past not only because we are outside in the sunlight probably more than a lot of people but we're around grow lights and we are around our phones and tablets and computers which also give off blue light and our lens does not protect the back of our eye uh, our macula from blue light but you know the jury's still out as to how much blue light is bad for you but I know for me that I should wear uh, more protective lenses when I'm working especially around grow lights or when I'm outside in the bright sun so and that's not for everyone but I just wanted to let you guys know about that and there are plenty of different kind of protective lenses you can get them on Amazon if you work around a lot of grow lights so you'll want to uh, maybe check those out they come in a wide range of prices and then something else that I ran across that was very interesting and then we'll get on to how to plant this little flower is that I've always noticed that this flower kind of glows in the sun and not just the petals but the green leaves as well and I even mentioned this in one of my first videos many years ago in my square foot garden so this one just kind of glows it's really pretty and you know I can eat all of these flowers and all of the leaves and it gives a lot of color to my garden too. Little did I know that this glowing um, appearance of the nasturtium flower has been um, documented and is known as the Elizabeth Linnaeus phenomenon and she noticed that there were scintillations or flashes of light that would emit from the nasturtium flower and the plant at certain times of day such as in at dusk and at dawn it would capture the sunlight in such a way that it almost seemed like it was giving off little flashes of light and I think it's just because of the way the leaves um, catch the sunlight at those times of day so I'll leave this link as well on this article from the Wordsworth Museum so this lady Elizabeth Linnaeus she was the daughter of a botanist so she was very um, I guess observant about nature and the things around her and of course in the 1700s when she noticed this they didn't have a lot of artificial light around so she was probably very sensitive and noticed this anyway her findings were published in an article in the acts of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences for 1762 on this little flower so what I did for you is I tried to take some pictures to catch this light on camera with a video it doesn't really show up as well but the glow around the flowers shows up great with uh, just still pictures 
So here are just a few of the pictures. I'll show some of the leaves and the petals. So now let's go ahead and take a look at how to plant your nasturtiums. You'll need to start by selecting the kind you want to grow and where you want to grow it. So when you're selecting your type, nasturtiums usually come in one of two kinds, either a dwarf or a trailing type. Now dwarf is basically just going to bush out and then your trailing will be like a long vine almost. And then also as far as selecting your location, um, nasturtiums grow wonderfully in just about any soil okay so very poor soil they should do fine if you do decide to sow it in your soil do note that it reseeds easily so it might be a place you would want to dedicate just to nasturtiums every year and you can find nasturtium seeds on uh, just about any seed website I found the best selection on Amazon I'll leave a link below the video if you'd like to shop through my link that would help me and you can order you some seeds there I can go ahead and show you a couple of the ones that I have grown and this one's called Yeti and it doesn't really have much of a colored center but it's just like a cream color and then this one is actually cherry rose some of the flowers are dark red and then some of them will be pink but this is very similar to what they call Empress of India um, a very dark red one of my favorites that I grew last year is called peach Melba and it is more of a dwarf variety and will not trail and of course the most common is the orange color you'll see those a lot and I like to just cut them off and put them in my windowsill. They're just really pretty. You can put them in little tiny bud vases. Now the trailing type will kind of cascade over your basket or your container where the dwarf will just usually grow right upright. Now sometimes the dwarf will trail a little bit. Um, and then also some of the varieties will have variegated leaves so they'll be green with a little bit of cream in them and that's called I think the Alaska mix and so I've grown that a couple of times and also make a note that when you're selecting your location if you want to grow the trailing variety um, it, the nasturtium plant does not have tendrils like you know sh sugar peas or cucumbers so it's not going to grab on by itself to a trellis you would have to work it up and then secure it to your trellis which would be pretty but if you have a, some way that you can grow it and then it can cascade over like a retaining wall or containers up on the patio something like that that's really pretty they can also be grown as a border plant and again just remember they reseed very easily so you may want to make this a dedicated spot uh, for your nasturtiums as I mentioned I like to grow them in containers the smaller the container the smaller the plant so some of these are very small pots they're grown in about four inches of soil um, I've also grown them here in the green stock system for those of you who have a green stock system they do very well there they will just cascade over the side and this year for the first time I will try to grow a variety called Mashua and this one actually produces edible tubers like much like sweet potatoes or something and it is a trailing variety I may try to work this actually up a trellis so we'll see how that goes I'll let you know this is um, actually native to the Andes mountains and I'm real anxious to see how it grows in my area 
So now let's look at how we can plant our seeds once you've selected your location and your seeds. Um, the best way and the easiest way obviously is to just go ahead and pop them in the ground or in your soil. Um, like I said, you don't have to have very fertile soil. They'll grow just about anywhere. And you'll need to plant them though about a half inch deep. And this is because they do require darkness for germination. So make sure you plant them deep enough. And if your soil is warm, around 70 degrees, it should take about 5 to 10 days for it to germinate. And this is what it will look like when it comes up. Now you can also plant these indoors and um, a frost will kill your nasturtiums so you don't want to put them out until after your frost date and that's why I start mine indoors. I plant them outdoors as well, uh, direct sow them just like I showed you, but I like to also start them indoors because that way I can get them out and hopefully get some nice blooms on them before the heat sets in. The nasturtiums like the cooler temperatures. So to speed up the germination, I usually will soak them in water or I'll rub them with some fine sandpaper and this always helps them germinate faster. And I'm just going to use the paper towel method so I have a nice little damp paper towel here. I'm going to stick them in there and put them in a Ziploc bag and I marked each one. Ziploc bag with the variety. So I think I started about five different kinds and now like I said they do require um, darkness for germination so I'm just going to pop them here into a shoe box. And my indoor temperatures usually stay at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So just a few days later I checked on them and they were sprouting beautifully. Now I'll just take each pre-sprouted seed and I'm going to put these in some little plastic Dixie cups. I went ahead and made some holes with my a little iron here and I got that at Harbor Freight for about, I don't know, I think it was four or five dollars. And now I'll just use Cocoa Core for the medium. And you will be able to tell the root side and the sprout side. So I'm just going to hold the sprouted side up and put the roots down. And after I have them transplanted, I'll just go ahead and feed them with a very weak, diluted, water-soluble fertilizer. One thing about nasturtiums also is they don't really require much fertilization, if any at all. And I do this just like I do all of my other seedlings. I'll just go ahead and put them outside, and I'll keep my eye on the weather report. If there's going to be a frost, I'll just go ahead and bring them inside. If it looks like there's going to be a heavy rain, um, I will remove them from their cups. I can leave them outside, uh, but I don't want to leave them in the tray if it looks like it's going to be a heavy rain because they will drown. Also, if you want to start your seeds indoors, but you don't have a warm location, maybe you're going to start them in a basement or something, then you can always just use a warming mat. This is what I did last year, and I just put them on there and then covered them up with a towel, and they germinated at the same rate for me then. So one way that is really easy to grow them is just to go ahead and pre-sprout them and then my temperatures usually start warming up in March so I can go ahead and move them into some of my containers and then if we get that rare cold come through, well I'll just bring it inside. So I planted that one in March and in June it was already blooming. So if I'd waited until after my frost date, I probably wouldn't have blooms until July and then it really starts to get too hot for them. They don't like the hot weather. So it, I always do kind of like to start them indoors and that's been something I've just started doing the past couple of years. 
So let's take a look at how to care for your nasturtiums once you have them growing. Remember that these are frost sensitive. So here's a picture of mine in October in the square foot garden. And then in November we had a freeze come through and there you go. So nasturtiums are reported to grow as a perennial in USDA zones 10 and warmer. So that would be something really wonderful to grow if you live somewhere warm, but it will require afternoon shade because as I mentioned, the nasturtiums do better in the cooler temperatures. So here are some nasturtiums in my container garden in June when the temperatures were still pretty cool. But as the heat starts to set in, uh, nasturtiums do like to be pruned a little bit throughout the season. You'll just want to take off any uh, dead heads to encourage blooming. Also, they require very little food and water. If you'd like to increase the blooms, you can feed it with a little bit of flower fertilizer to do that. Also, um, they require very little water, so they are pretty drought tolerant, but you do need to make sure that you're watering them about at least an inch deep every week, either from hand watering or the rainfall. So one thing about nasturtiums is they are a magnet for aphids. Some people even grow these as a trap crop just to kind of uh, deter aphids from other plants in their garden. Where I always see aphids is underneath the green leaves and they're usually right there clustered in the center. Also another way to notice that you may have aphids is you'll notice your leaves start to curl. The growth will stop. You may notice ants and um, ladybugs around your plants and the reason why you see ants and ladybugs is they are also there uh, because they're aphids. Ants protect the aphids and ladybugs eat the aphids. So always keep your eye out for aphids if you notice that you have a problem. The way I like to treat for them is just to prune the entire plant back and only because if you spray or you try to treat for the insects it's so hard to get to them because of the way um, they sit on the plant up underneath those leaves, right in the center, and there's a lot of them on there once they've found your plants. So I just cut them back, and I'd say every, out of every four of five plants that I cut back, they regrow beautifully. I also plant a lot of nasturtiums so that if aphids have found them in one area, maybe they found them in my, in my container garden, they will not have found them in my square foot garden so I can enjoy them all season. So I don't put all my eggs in one basket. I try to scatter my plantings throughout my gardens. So here's a picture of one that I cut back and I think that was around in July and then by fall especially when the temperature started to cool down a little bit, the plant was beautiful again and I was able to enjoy it. And here's a picture of something I've only seen one time on my nasturtium leaves, and that was a cabbage worm. This is probably because I pulled out a lot of the plants in my garden, which were attracting the um, cabbage butterfly. So I guess they found the nasturtium. So, um, yeah, there's not a lot of problems that I've ever really had with the nasturtiums other than the aphids. And so it's a really, very easy plant, really, to take care of. Now let's look at how to harvest and this is very easy to do if you want just the leaves just take those so I like to just cut my just my leaves off that's the only part I use I don't use the stem it really has a very strong flavor um, the leaves are like a peppery flavor also remember that on here you will find um, little seeds okay and you can pickle these and they call those poor man capers I haven't ever personally done it but um, that's a very popular thing to do because the nasturtium plant sets seeds so easily. So you'll see a lot of these and don't confuse them with the bloom. They look kind of similar when they first start forming, but one will turn into the seed and the other one will be a beautiful bloom. So you can just take off your uh, whole entire flowers. I like to put those in little vases so I can have them throughout the day and to use in the kitchen. So let's take a look at how we can use it in the kitchen. I already mentioned you can use the seeds to pickle those and make them as a poor man's caper. Now another thing I like to do is use the leaves and I'll just throw those in an occasional stir fry and I save the flowers for fresh eating. So I like to cook the leaves a little bit to take some of that taste out of the uh, green leaves. So really good in stir fries. And as I mentioned earlier, if you just quickly you just wilt them down and then you have preserved a lot of the nutrients that are in the leaves. So I figured out how much lutein was in my eye supplement. 
and I compared that to how many petals I would need. I did a little bit of a calculation and it looked like I'd need half a cup of uh, yellow petals in order to equal the amount of lutein that was in one um, daily dose of an eye supplement. So I don't know that I can eat a whole half a cup of nasturtium petals every day, but um, I just wanted to let you know I did um, measure that out. And just to give you an idea or point of reference, it's just how much lutein is in the petals compared to an eye supplement. So I prefer to use the petals on things like sandwiches and even burgers and salads, of course. That's my favorite way to use it. I love to have that little pop of color. It certainly will help you eat the rainbow every day if you just throw some different colored petals on your salads. And I even use the flowers as a decoration for dessert. So there's another way you can use it. So when you have your nasturtiums up and growing, you're welcome to head on over to my channel where over there I have a playlist and if you want some ideas for different ways to use your nasturtiums, there will be a playlist there just to kind of give you some ideas of ways that I've used it. As a matter of fact, I'm always adding to it. So if I happen to make some pickled nasturtium seeds one day and turn them into a poor man's caper, that's where you'll find the recipe, okay? So thanks so much for watching, and as always, please feel free to share this with your friends and family. I sure would appreciate it. Have a beautiful day.